of uh, joint meetings. It's a joint committee meeting of the House Natural Resources Commission and Wildlife Committee and the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, call me in order now. My name is Amy Sheldon, and I, I'm the chair of House Natural Resources Commission and Wildlife. I'd like to take just a minute to go around the room and have the members of each committee say who they are. And I represent the town of Middlebury in the House. I'm Tim Brigland. I'm the chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. I'm from Bedford and represent four towns in the Upper Valley. Lorna Sibelliana. I am the chair of I'm Catherine Benham with the Joint Fiscal Office, and last year in the budget, you all, uh, the budget requested a study be done on, on decarbonization methods. Can you use the mic? Yeah. Please. Uh, in the, in the, bu the budget called for a study of decarbonization. We put out an RFP, we had some responses, and we uh, ended up selecting resources for the future who are here to present their report. Uh, the report is posted on your committee pages, or will be shortly. It will also be posted on um, the JFO website as well as the presentation will be in all those places as well. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark and Wes. Uh, I'm Mark Afsted. I'm a fellow at Resource for the Future and I'm also the director of the Carbon Pricing Initiative there. And my name is Wesley Look. I am Senior Research Associate at Resource for the Future. Um, Thank you all for having us here today, all members of the committee, both committees. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll start by giving some kind of introductory background information um, that led into our study, and then I'll 
pass it to Marky and I will both share the floor. Any initial questions at the outset, though? Great. Please feel free. So you said you wanted to wait to take questions till the end, right? I'd like to hold questions. Okay, great. So as Catherine said, this study was requested by the assembly um, in the budget bill last year. <clears throat> uh, our study aims to inform the policy dialogue, but is not intended to address the complete universe of policy options. And also, we really see our role as trying to inform you all in making your decisions and having your deliberative process on policies that may make sense for the state of Vermont. We're not offering recommendations. So we're just trying to give you as much information as we can, um, you know, subject to the limitations of the budget and time that we had to work. So we, we both represent um, an organization called Resources for the Future, or RFF. RFF is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank. It's an independent, nonprofit research institution, so we're not a sort of generally a for-hire consulting shop, nor are we an advocacy organization. The charge of, of RFF is to improve environmental, energy, and natural resource decisions through impartial economic research um, and policy engagement. So uh, this is a nonpartisan organization uh, that is about generating the best information possible, again, for policymakers <clears throat> to make their most well-informed decisions for and you all in this case. Um, so into the actual study. So we have here a um, simple chart showing the trends of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Vermont. Um, and you can see that emissions have been, have been generally rising with some trends of, of declination, but the, the recent trend is, is going up. Um, on the sort of bottom and to the right of the graph, these are the state's various stated emissions targets. One of them is in the rearview mirror. There's a 2012 target that is in statute here in Vermont, and that was, was missed. Um, uh, the, the three orange diamonds going down and to the right are all part of that statute. Uh, the next one is at 2028. Um, we don't have a pointer here. I'd be pointing this. It's kind of square in the middle there. Um, that target is 50 percent below 1990 levels by the year 2028. Um, as you can see, things are going up, not headed in that direction. Um, the next statutory target is in the year 2050, um, and that is um, 80, 85 percent. I'm blanking on that exactly, but it's it's close to um, almost net zero carbon emissions by by 2050. Um, <clears throat> another target that I really that I want to highlight because it's been discussed in the public policy dialogue, as far as we can tell here in Vermont, is the 2028. U.S. Climate Alliance. It's a typo. It should be 2025. Oh, 2025. <laughs> that's right. Um, U.S. Climate Alliance target, which is between 26 and 28 percent emissions reductions from 2005 levels. Um, anyway, again, it's clear that the sort of business as usual trajectory is is not headed in that direction, and <clears throat> we we estimate a slightly different trend based upon um, national data sets uh, produced by the Energy Information Administration, and that's why you get this, this slightly declining line here. Um, so if the state were to do nothing, we estimate that those are the, where the emissions levels would be headed based upon federal policy. Um, of course, that's a constantly changing landscape, but that's, that's why we show this shift to a downward trend, and that again is in the absence of any additional Vermont policy, but is still shy of the targets. <clears throat> and so one initial takeaway is that additional policy, in our estimate, additional policy at the state level or at the regional level here in Vermont or in New England would be required to hit any of the targets that Vermont currently has on the books. In addition to looking at the sort of overall trends, um, we, drawing from the state's existing greenhouse gas emissions inventory, represent the shares of emissions by sector in the state. And Vermont's shares are on the left, and the U.S. shares are on the right for comparison. Do you want a pointer? Oh, no, it's okay. I mean, it, it, if you would like me to have one, I'm happy to. 
one of the things that to us jumps out in this comparison is that the, the orange piece of the pie, the sort of the light orange piece of the pie on the left side of each of the pie charts is much larger in the state of Vermont than it is nationwide. That piece of the pie is transportation, transportation sector emissions, which are the result of consuming gasoline and diesel primarily, um, but any, any fuels that produce greenhouse gas emissions. The other significant difference is the other orange wedge, the dark orange wedge on the top right in each, and that's um, end use residential and commercial fuel use. So that's, again, home heating fuels, home heating oil, um, natural gas in some parts of the state, but not much. Um, and again, that's a much larger, a much larger share of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions come from those home heating fuels than they do nationally. Uh, the other thing that we'd point out is that the blue, the sort of, um, there are a couple of blue shades of blue there, but electricity generation, which is a very large wedge, it's about 30% in the U.S. emissions pie, is only 10% in Vermont. So that's also significant from the perspective of what policies may be most cost effective in Vermont in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll go into this in more detail, but sort of the upshot of this is that um, transportation and, and home heating fuels, home or business heating fuels, are some of the, the least responsive um, areas of the sector, uh, areas of the economy um, to carbon pricing. They're, in, in economic speak, they're the least elastic. So as prices change, people are least likely to change their behavior patterns in terms of consuming transportation fuels, which we can see as the prices go up and down, sometimes even by a dollar at the pump, and it doesn't change, it doesn't change consumption patterns that much. So we'll go into this in more detail, but we wanted to give you this as, as a lay of the land. Um, so this will be my last slide for a little bit, and I'll pass it to Mark. Uh, <clears throat> in this report, we look at two types, two main categories of, of decarbonization policies. The first is carbon pricing policies, and that's really where our strength lies and, and what the RFP with the JFO emphasized, which is, I think, why we thought it would be a good fit for us to do this project. To us, carbon pricing policies include at least two types of policy. One, carbon tax policies, and two, cap and trade policies. We refer to both of those as carbon pricing policies, just to be very clear, because I think people see that in, di in different ways. But we refer to those as both carbon pricing policies. And the reason why cap and trade is part of that is because it puts a price per ton through the value of the permits. Um, we do a quantitative analysis of carbon pricing policies only, um, and it's a very, um, a very rigorous quantitative analysis. We'll be talking about that. We also, though, in response to our visit here, which involved conversations with some of you all, um, we, we recognized that the state of Vermont also considers non-pricing policies to be an important component of their decarbonization strategy. And so we wanted to at least include some, if limited, analysis of non-pricing policies as well, to look at both as a holistic package, because that's most likely how the state will um, continue to sort of pursue decarbonization as, it, as we heard from, from folks, um, stakeholders as well as elected representatives when we were here in September. And so we've done what we consider to be largely a qualitative review of emissions reductions, potential from uh, non-pricing policies. This, though, does have some numbers associated with it. And we, we say qualitative on our end because we're relying on other people's quantitative analysis, and particularly the quantitative analysis of the Vermont Climate Action Commission um, the commission, as you, as you may all be familiar, was appointed by the governor, um, created by the governor in 2017. Um, in addition to taking the estimates from the VCAC, we, we do our own very simple estimate of what, would what emissions reductions would result from increasing the existing renewable energy standard in Vermont, which would require the state, would require a number of different things, but the tier one renewables requirement would be 75% renewable energy by 2032. Um, and we assume 100% by 2030. And then we basically take a mid-range between that. So we can go into more detail on that if you're interested. But 
So we have carbon pricing policies on one hand, carbon tax and cap and trade, and then on the other hand, these non-pricing policies. And again, to sort of put a little bit more flesh on the bones there, that's electric vehicle incentives. Some examples of non-pricing policies are electric vehicle, energy efficiency incentives, weatherization programs, um, investments in low carbon agriculture, uh, as well as then some of these regulatory policies like a increased renewable energy standard. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Mark. Okay. Um, so carbon pricing maybe means a lot of things to uh, a lot of different people. So just to be clear here on, on what we, we looked at. So we're looking at carbon pricing policies that are going to vary across uh, a number of different dimensions. So the first dimension is going to be what the price is, and that's either through the tax or through the indirectly through the price of allowances in the cap and trade program. We're also going to consider uh, covering different number of sectors. So a policy that covers only the transportation sector or a policy that covers all sectors except for electricity um, and, and in between. Um, really importantly to the kind of the impacts of, of carbon pricing is how what you do with the revenue. And so we're going to show that, that the um, revenue use, how, how you decide to spend uh, the, the money that was raised is, is very, very important. And then we're also going to consider briefly um, looking at uh, Vermont-only policies or policies where Vermont uh, teams up with some of its neighbors to pursue uh, carbon pricing. And to just give you a, a sense of what we're talking about here in terms of scale, uh, $20 carbon tax is equivalent to a tax of about 18 cents per gallon on gasoline. So as, as, we th as I say different carbon pricing numbers, you can kind of just scale up or down uh, to see how big you, that would be uh, at the pump. So uh, in this analysis, uh, we consider four alternative carbon price paths. Uh, we choose these for um, a number of different reasons, but I just want to mention that these are illustrative, and we are not, any time we, we, we look at one specific policy, we're not trying to say that this is what uh, the state should be doing. And so we consider the Essex price path from the Essex plan. Uh, that policy uh, phases in from a $5 tax until it reaches $40. Um, we considered what we call the WCI price path, the Western Climate Initiative. So we're considering a, a cap and trade program where um, Vermont joins with uh, Quebec and California in the Western Climate Initiative. Uh, that price uh, in that cap and trade program has a floor, and that floor grows over time. And the price has been historically at that floor, and so we assume going forward that we're, we'll still be at that uh, price floor. Uh, and so we use that price floor path. And then we have just two kind of other um, medium and high price paths just for, uh, to, to show people what would happen if we uh, increase the price uh, to uh, starting at either $30 or, or $60 and rising over time. So again, uh, I mentioned that uh, what you do with the revenue uh, tends to be very important for the environmental and economic impacts of carbon pricing. So here we're going to think of, uh, we're going to consider three alternative revenue uses, although we acknowledge there are more uses. So the first one we're going to consider is uh, lump sum rebates. This is where the revenues are returned equally through equal per household payments to each household in Vermont. We're going to consider a policy that takes the revenue and uses it to reduce uh, taxes on wages. And this will have some stimulative effect and will offset some of the negative impacts the policy might have on GDP or uh, employment. Uh, the Essex plan is, uh, is the first uh, carbon pricing policy where I, I've seen this, this type of revenue use. So it's interesting to look at it in this context where the Essex plan uh, devoted some of the revenue to finance reductions in electricity rates for uh, residential, commercial, and industrial customers. And this was really an idea to give households an incentive to switch uh, to clean uh, electricity, because uh, most of the electricity in Vermont is, is carbon free. And so uh, we're going to look at these three different alternatives. Uh, as using all the revenue for lump sum rebates or all the revenue for rebates, electricity rebates. Um, we do acknowledge that uh, a policy could do a little bit of each. Um, so you could, there's no reason why you have to choose to use the money all in one place. You can spread it across different baskets. And we'll also note that uh, due to time, 
budget and modeling constraints, we're not able to look at what happens when the revenue is, is reinvested in non-pricing policies, although we'll have some, uh, be able to talk about that a little bit, but we're not going to be able to really look at the deep economic impacts of that type of revenue use. As I mentioned, we're going to look at uh, covering different types of sectors. Uh, we're going to consider the kind of the broadest uh, type of policy we call economy-wide electricity exempt. This covers every sector except for electricity. As we know, uh, Vermont is a participant in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Program, and we um, don't see a reason for, for Vermont to, um, to pull out of that program, and so we just left that program on its own untouched. Uh, you can also, um, you, the, you know, no policy is required to be economy-wide, and so we're looking at also two different types of smaller policies, uh, one that covers transportation and heating fuels, another that, that covers uh, just transportation emissions. And again, I mentioned that uh, we're going to consider some different regional scopes where Vermont acts on its own to implement these policies, and a regional uh, type policy where where all the New England states act together under one uh, type of policy. Okay, so that's uh, kind of just a, a rehash of or an explanation of, of what we did, and now we can get into uh, some of the key findings. So the first key finding we have is that carbon pricing only is unlikely to meet the U.S. Climate Alliance targets, which are 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels in 2025. <laughs> and so here, I've I've chosen four different types of programs just to give you an example, although we have many, many more types of policies in the report itself. But just for a high level here, we can think of just these few different types of policies. So the first, the TCI program is the cap and trade program on transportation emissions only. And when we were doing this analysis, the state had not yet actually signed onto the transportation and climate initiative statement to craft a program or craft a policy proposal over the next year. So we kind of had to take some liberties with this one. We assumed a price path that was similar to the Western Climate Initiative price, price path. It's purely speculative, and a true transportation and climate initiative policy will probably look different. Um, you could imagine that the price could be, could be much lower. Um, and that, again, that's going to depend on negotiations between, between states. And then we also consider the Western Climate Initiative cap and trade program, where Vermont links its transportation and heating emissions to California and Quebec's program. And then we also consider the Essex plan, which, as I mentioned, is an economy-wide carbon tax. And then just for kind of full scope, we consider the policy that kind of uh, has the highest price and most coverage. To give you an example of uh, what could be possible from, from the type of uh, carbon pricing, and we call this high price path that um, has a carbon tax of about $77 in, in 2025. But you'll notice here on all four of these uh, policies, none of them are achieving emissions uh, 26 to 28 percent below 2005 in 2025. So the high price path uh, uh, comes the closest, uh, but it, by, on its own, it does not, uh, we are not projecting it to meet those targets based on our modeling analysis. Okay, and I'm going to turn it back over to Wes to talk about some of the non-pricing analysis. So, so again, the analysis we did on non-pricing policies was assembling research and estimates that others had done for the most part, and, and that was primarily the, the Vermont Climate Action Commission. Um, there are over around 50 individual policy recommendations in that document. Uh, as I had mentioned before, this includes things like EV incentives, weatherization programs, energy efficiency programs. Um, we also, as I said before, looked at this 100% renewable energy standard. Um, and what we find, essentially, is that while with carbon pricing alone, the state, we do not estimate that the state would achieve its emissions targets. Um, that with a combined approach between carbon pricing and non-pricing, the state would be estimated to have emissions reductions um, commensurate with and, and actually beyond the U.S. Climate Alliance or, or Paris target, and that's, again, that 26 to 28 percent by 2025. Um, and, and actually, that is for all of the scenarios we modeled here. So you can see under TCI, WCI, Essex, and the high price, they're all 
emissions reductions that are above or greater than that 28% threshold. So that is one of, I think, the key findings from this report is that there, these two approaches together could achieve these targets, um, and even with some relatively modest carbon pricing policies. Um, one thing that um, we have not emphasized in the report, but uh, I will say is that there is somewhat of a fit between pricing and non-pricing policies in that pricing can generate revenue that will be able to help implement non-pricing policies. Because in some cases, the non-pricing policies may call for public expenditure. Programs like an electric vehicle purchase incentive, for example, um, or weatherization programs. Um, and so if, if the aim is to have a revenue neutral policy, then you all will be looking for revenue some, for, from somewhere to pay for those, um, pay for those policies and, and carbon pricing may be a good source. Um, we will talk more about though how uh, the use of revenue will require a number of trade-offs, um, but that's, that's the basic estimate. Okay, so um, as, as, as we mentioned, we did a pretty thorough analysis on the environmental and economic impacts of carbon pricing. So here I want to run through uh, some of those uh, results. So there are costs and benefits of carbon pricing. Um, and so the costs are going to be, you know, increased prices for fuels and energy intensive goods. That's how carbon pricing works. We can't run away from the fact that it will increase the price of gasoline. It's also going to change income, and we could also maybe see some of those changes going to be uh, realized in changes to state GDP or employment levels. On the other side, there are benefits, and we're going to measure two types of benefits here. We're going to look at the benefits of GHG reductions, and we're going to measure the value of those reductions using uh, social cost of carbon estimates. And there are also um, benefits of reduced criteria air pollutants. And so when you burn fossil fuels in your car or other places, those often emit um, other particles, other forms of pollution besides carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. Those include sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, uh, particulate matter, there's two different types of particulate matter. PM 2.5 is the one that actually has very negative health impacts. It's a, it's a particulate matter that can actually just kind of go through your skin into your lungs, it's so small. And so what we do is we use EPA estimates of what the value of those reduced emissions uh, are. And so to get another quantitative dollar value of those benefits. And so kind of I think the main key finding is that the economic impact of carbon pricing policies we studied is projected to be small. So if we look at this first row, the first, uh, if we look at this table, the first row is the change in economic welfare per household. We consider this to be the most complete measure of the costs of a carbon pricing policy. It takes into account the changes in prices and the changes in income. Now for each of these um, policies, this is also the kind of the average cost for the average person. Obviously impacts will be different across different types of people. People who drive more will have larger impacts than people who drive less. So these policies are, are, are running in the range of $28 uh, per person to $240 uh, per person. And, and just to be clear, uh, what we're doing in the TCI, WCI, and high price path is we are looking, these are the costs when we use the revenues to be rebated to households. And then in the Essex plan, um, this is where we are combining uh, rebates to low-income households and uh, revenues uh, for electricity subsidies as called for in that plan. And I just want to underscore here that this is, these are costs for an average household. So in terms of average <coughs> income level, we will in a couple of slides talk about costs per um, income quintile. So you'll see for low income households, for upper income households, what the different estimated impacts are. And so, um, but again, I, as I mentioned, you know, this policy is gonna have costs and benefits we project that the benefits uh, per household will exceed the costs for every single policy we look at. So an example of the TCI, uh, we project that the environmental benefits per household are $56 uh, 
versus the cost of $28. Now to give you an idea of where these benefits are coming from, about 60% of these benefits are from uh, the climate benefits, the reduced GHG emissions. About 40% of the benefits are from uh, reduced uh, local air pollution. You know, have, having, having done this in the done this type of analysis at the federal level, you know, in Washington, D.C., everyone wants to know what's going to happen to jobs and, and kind of the economy, and so we look at that here as well. And, and we see that these impacts would be small. These are very tiny changes, regardless of policy design. To give you an idea about this change in state GDP, this is a percent change from business as usual. If the uh, state economy was, an, was, a, was to grow 1% per year, in the absence of a policy between now and 2025. If you introduce this policy, that's equivalent to reducing the growth rate from 1% to 0.997%. It was, it's, it's such a small number, it would be, you wouldn't be able to see it in the rounding error. And it would be very hard to separate from statistical noise. And also to point out that there's, there's some fluctuation between costs and benefits, the Essex plan is showing a positive impact to GDP. Again, it's very small. But yeah, I was, I was going to emphasize here that as what really uh, how you use the revenue matters here when you use the elect, uh, some of the revenue uh, to subsidize electricity, we actually see a growth in GDP and we see an increase in the level of employment. Uh, again, these numbers are, are small either way, either direction, but you can actually we're finding could have some increased uh, GDP or uh, employment if you use the revenues for electricity subsidies, and we don't have this on this table, we find the same thing if you use the revenue to reduce taxes on, on wages. And importantly, uh, a carbon pricing policy would generate significant revenue for the state, uh, depending on the carbon price level and the, the number of sectors covered. So as we go from left to right, the price is increasing and the number of sectors is increasing. So that's really it's just driven by the price level and how much emissions are, are being covered. So um, as we mentioned, these, these costs that I showed are um, kind of for an average household. And we take kind of a state level <coughs> cost number and we divide it by the number of households to put into a per household number. But we, we understand and we'll show that the you know, economic impacts are not evenly distributed. And, low and, and one of the reasons for this is that low-income and rural ho households spend a larger fraction of income on energy. And of course, we would expect that carbon-intensive industries such as fuel suppliers uh, would be affected more than other industries. So we're not anticipating big impacts on the services industry, but you might see some impacts um, you know, in, in this, the sectors that you would expect. So transportation, natural gas, utilities, those, those are the types of uh, fuel dealers, those are the types of industries we would expect to be more affected uh, than others. And we don't, I don't have any tables for this, the industry impacts in our slides today, but they are in, in the report. And so I think another one of our key findings is that although, you know, low income and rural households spend a larger fraction of their, of their income on, on um, energy, we can design these policies in a way that will offset those impacts on those households. So uh, in the TCI scenario, the, the, the rebate, if we give this rebate straight back to households, it's equal to about $200 rebate per person. And that rebate is, is more than enough to offset the increased energy prices for quintiles one and quintiles two. And I have an email from my colleague, that will tell, I'll tell you exactly how much these, um, so quintile one is a household that has $23,000 or income or less. Uh, quintile two is between 23,000 and 45,000. Uh, quintile three is households between 45 and 70,000. And quintile four is households 70,000 to 105,000. Quintile five is anyone making more than $105,000 per year. And so uh, we'll also notice that as you kind of go left to right, you'll see that actually it doesn't really, because we're using the rebates in most of the, 
it, because all these policies are rebating uh, revenues to low-income households, they're better off than they would be otherwise in each case. Now, if we use the revenues another way, that might not be true. But in, in these particular, these four scenarios, using the revenues to give rebates back to the households, offsets that increased income that they're receiving, that revenue rebate is enough to offset the higher energy costs and costs of other goods. And you also see here that um, we, do, uh, we, don't, we aren't able to do income by county, but we are able to do income or county. And so just summarizing here, we do show that, um, that, that, county, that counties besides Chittenden County have slightly larger average impacts than other counties, and primarily it's due to uh, longer driving. Um, but we would also expect that we, we know that the, the average household in each county it represents someone around quintile three, and so we still expect that low-income house, even though we haven't specifically shown it, we do expect that low-income households in rural counties would be, uh, would be better off. And again, this is on average, there's an average household in each quintile. Um, and so there is heterogeneity, no two households are the same. And we do have to remember that and caveat that when we're, we're looking at these results. So not every single household in quintile one might be better off, but we expect the, the, the person who has the average expenditure pattern would be. And, and so we, I think our, our last kind of main key finding is that is that the revenue use introduces trade-offs that need to be considered by policymakers. So according to our analysis, as I've shown, these per household rebates more than offset the cost of increased energy prices for the average low-income household. If we instead use the money to uh, reduce taxes on wages, this would actually uh, increase the state GDP and incre increase the level of employment but for most low-income households, uh, these changes in, in, in taxes would not be enough to fully offset their higher energy prices. And so finally, although we didn't look at it quantitatively, we didn't do a, a, a deep dive into the economic impacts of non-pricing policies, we, 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 we do know that to the extent that we don't devote revenue to finance those policies, that can reduce emissions further, but it would also reduce the amount of money we're able to give back to the, ho uh, the households to offset the economic impacts of the higher prices um, for those households. And so there's this trade-off here where, where you need to consider, if, if you do decide to consider a, a carbon pricing policy, this is a, a very important trade-off between trying to think about how you're gonna think about the distributional uh, impacts of the policy or trying to use the policy to uh, have m deeper emissions reductions and try to achieve some of those uh, emissions targets. And again, I just want to emphasize our results here are for putting all your money into one basket or the other. And, and so I don't want you to think that you can't do some type of hybrid approach that mixes how the, how the money is spent. <coughs> Okay, and so if we planned for 40 minutes and we've gone through most of our time here. Um, so I just want to give you some caveats here. Um, we do not model policy-induced innovation, so we are not able to look at what would happen if uh, by implementing the policy that the costs of renewables or the costs of EVs would, would decrease. So we're holding those costs constant across, across our analysis. As I mentioned on the last page, um, the average household impacts masks potentially large differences in impacts for specific households. One thing we haven't talked about too much, um, and no, nope, we don't have a slide for that, um, is that the Vermont only policy, the New Hampshire border, uh, could be an issue. Now, we don't have a very good job, uh, we don't have a very good understanding uh, from Washington DC how many drivers are going to increase their out-of-state purchases. So what we did is we assumed that the drivers who already drive buy their, their gasoline in New Hampshire would continue to buy their gasoline in New Hampshire. People who currently buy it in Vermont continue to buy it in Vermont. 
Now, to the extent that we've, we've missed that, to the extent that people are going to try to shift their, their purchase behavior more, we would be overestimating uh, the emissions reductions uh, from this policy because people would be avoiding the tax uh, by um, going to New Hampshire. And then I just want to emphasize again um, that we, we looked at a range of estimates for the emissions reductions potentials of the non-pricing policies, but we weren't able to do a full economic impact analysis of those non-pricing policies. And so we think that further analysis and research is going to be warranted there. We want to know, we want to be able to answer the question you have is, how many jobs is this non-pricing policy going to create by investing in our local economy and our local infrastructure? And that's not something we can answer right now. Do you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you. Well, I guess we do have time for some questions. If the committee members have questions, Representative Yantachka. Yeah. Um, did you look at the um, range of fluctuation? Mike, can you use the mic? Mike. Mike. Did, you, uh, did you look at the uh, how much gas or fuel oil prices fluctuate over a year without current pricing? I mean, it's not something we particularly looked at, but yes, fuel prices can go up or down 50 cents very easily, uh, and we've seen that quite a bit over the last couple of years. And so, you know, uh, the transportation and, and climate initiative policy we considered had a had a, a price of about $20 through the cap and trade program. That's like an 18 cent uh, additional cost uh, for gasoline under that policy. I'd just add that we we did use. Um, our business as usual projection uses the, again, the projections from the Energy Information Administration, the Federal Energy, Admin, Energy Information Administration. Um, and those projections include fuel price projections over the next you know, 10 to 20 years. And, and were you able to tell how much uh, um, consumption would, be, would uh, go down as prices increase at 50 cents per gallon? Um, yeah, our, our report does go into like changes in uh, prices and, and demand for, for the goods. Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't give you a very specific number, but it's, it's in the report. Thank you. Representative Chestnut Tangerman. Does your report? Uh, attempt to quantify um, decarbonization benefits of, of you know, applying $20 million to electrification of transportation versus weatherization. So that would be in that, that category of non-pricing policies. And we, so we include, basically we include the emissions benefits of all of the policies that um, had an emissions benefit estimate given to them in the VCAC report. Um, that does include weatherization programs. It does include electrification of transportation programs. But it, we basically, the way we do that is we just sort of take it all as a group. We don't do a trade-offs analysis, if that's what you're asking. So what would be the relative benefit of going in one direction versus another or down one policy pathway versus another? We, we don't do that kind of comparative analysis. We look at it all as one group and assume that it all gets implemented. Broken out within that group, are there? Are there? there are, yeah, um, in sort of broad brush categories. Um, and, and actually, the, the report itself has more granular detail. It's, it's a public <coughs> document that we could point you to, or, or others in the room here who have worked on it directly. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a couple questions. So I'm wondering, um, have other, has anyone else or other states been successful in doing like the rebate policies, actually implementing them? Right. Um, no. So there's not, to my knowledge. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But so um, a province, British Columbia, has its carbon tax is revenue neutral, and it's a combination of rebates and uh, business tax cuts, and so they have implemented. Uh, a partial rebate program. To individuals? Yes. Okay. And then I'm also wondering, um, 
it, your benefits pretty much primarily focus on health care benefits. Is that what's in the model? Or, I mean, the benefits that accrue to Vermonters from these policies. So the, the health benefits are, are the benefits of reduced particulate matter pollution in Vermont. So that would, that would accrue to, to Vermonters directly. And can you articulate more of the other specific benefits? Uh, so we looked at those health benefits, and then we looked at um, the climate benefits from reduced GHG using a social cost of carbon estimate. Um, obviously, those benefits are global. And so um, we, we were not able to do a, uh, a kind of Vermont-specific social cost of carbon. That was way beyond the scope of our analysis. Um, so we can't say specifically how much those benefits are Vermont or uh, New England or global. Um, but we do provide that number because at the end of the day, if you care about climate, it's because you should care about, you should care about the global well-being. Representative from Williston. Great. Thank you very much. I have two questions. One is a follow up from the chair. Did you monetize in the report um, the health effects from diminished uh, particular matter? Yes. Thank you. And the second question is um, around the California and Quebec initiative. And is that fully explored in the report with, with um, well, how about just that? Yeah, so we, uh, in section 4.7, we, instead, so section four of our report is a, a analysis of carbon pricing policies. And uh, most of that just uses uh, kind of illustrative examples of, okay, what happens if you have a high price versus a low price? Uh, but in section 4.7, we do do specific analysis of the Western Climate Initiative, uh, our representation of what we thought could be one potential outcome of the Transportation Climate Initiative, and the Essex Plan. Thank you. Representative Dolan. Are the benefits, benefits that you described over a certain time period where you then brought those benefits to present value? Yes, there are the present value of reduced emissions in that time period, but the benefits could accrue over over years and they are discounted back to the future or to the present. And does that assume that there's no increase in emissions from other states or jurisdictions that could overwhelm those benefits? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we do look at um, changes in emissions uh, in other, other northeast states in our report. Uh, generally, we find those changes to be uh, relatively small. So we, we expect that um, very little of the emissions reductions in Vermont would be offset by increased emissions in its neighboring states. So to underscore that, when Mark says the changes would be relatively small, it's the changes induced by the implementation of a policy in Vermont. It's, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but um, that's what he's referring to there, what would be called leakage, that if Vermont implements a policy, does it lead to emissions increasing elsewhere? Um, that's the phenomenon of leakage. The other thing I want to say about the benefits is that most of the things that are quantified, both emissions reductions and public health and climate benefits in, in this report are done on an annual, strictly an annual basis. So when we say that emissions are at a certain level in 2025, that's, and, and then there are commensurate benefits associated with the emissions reductions, right, that you've, you've, you've reduced to hit that level, that's just for that one year. It's not quantifying, let's say we're just talking about the benefits, it's not quantifying the benefits that have accrued over each of the years, say we're talking about 2025 and you, the policy starts in 2020, you're going to have emissions reductions every year along the way going down. The re reductions will be greater, the emissions will be less, and so you're going to have cumulative benefits. Does that make sense? Benefits that are, that are achieved in each of the years, we don't estimate. So basically we are providing in some sense a conservative lowball estimate because we're just looking at one year instead of a, the cumulative benefits over a five or 10 year window. Rep. 
Representative Briglin and then Pat. Um, I had a question about um, some of the costs and benefits that you highlighted. And I was searching for other things. You uh, had a small handful, uh, I think, in terms of the costs and the benefits. Um, and I'll just suggest one of each and um, wonder if these fall in there. In terms of costs, were there issues that related to exacerbating income inequality and, and how um, some of these different pricing initiatives um, would um, be more challenging for lower income people and, and other initiatives might be less challenging? Um, yeah, if we go back to this, this slide, um, this is quintile one is the lowest income households. And so what we're showing here is, is when you use the revenues um, to give the direct rebates back to the households, they're, they're better off monetarily than they would have been otherwise. And so we're, we're, we would say that this is uh, reducing uh, inequality. Um, but what I haven't shown you here and is in the report is if you use the, the revenues to reduce, say, wage income, that doesn't give as large of a benefit to low-income households as the rebate, and so that could actually exacerbate the inequality. And I have work at the, on federal carbon pricing that looks at even further like capital tax cuts or corporate tax cuts, and those are um, another type of policy that doesn't address, that, that doesn't address this um, potential issue of, of, of inequality. And so what's, what's really fascinating about the rebate approach is that it, um, it, it actually um, improves the inequality situation by reducing it. And on the, on the benefit side, um, it wasn't clear to me, with a carbon pricing mechanism, with the idea that in terms of reducing um, carbon fuel usage, would simply energy usage decline, or was it assumed that there would be substitution um, you know, with other presumably cleaner fuel? So the, the model does allow for uh, some substitution, although we don't predict uh, a lot of substitution. And so it's, it's really, it's reductions coming from, if for transportation, for example, it's, it's reductions coming from uh, improved uh, efficiency of the vehicle fleet and from reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled. But not necessarily substituting electricity for? Yeah, we, we, we do allow for that, but we don't see uh, a lot of that substitution occurring at these at these price levels. And, and what I was trying to get at there is there actually a benefit there of um, substituting consumers paying for fuels that come from outside of the Vermont economy and replacing them with fuels that come from within the economy, <coughs> actually contributing to that kind of growth. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, again, the, the model does kind of take account for that. It's so the, the state does import all its, all its fuels, and so we see those imports go down. And so consumers have, uh, they, they can choose where to, to, to spend that money. Um, and so we find that it's a, a mix of, of goods, some that were to produce here, and some that are, are some, of, some of it is their, the model's predicting increased imports of other types of goods. Uh, two things. First, uh, just a clarification, because I couldn't always read all the fine print. Uh, when you're showing either a cost or a benefit per household, it, it's per what? Is that an annual, an annual benefit? An annual. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and my question is, um, uh, for uh, in the options where you are. Um, uh, mitigating the impact of, of the higher energy costs on one side by targeting uh, uh, a benefit to rural uh, Vermonters or lower income uh, Vermonters. Does the report get, get into it all, um, how that would be done, how people would be found eligible uh, for that or, or anything like that? No. <laughs> no, we don't. I think that's, there's, that's, obviously a very important policy consideration how exactly that administration would work. Um, there's some interesting research that's been done on the implementation of such a program at the federal level um, by an affiliate and colleague of uh, Resources for the Future named Chad Stone. Um, I think much of that would apply at the state level and 
if if you all get to the point of of having a discussion around that, we'd be happy to provide some additional resources that could help inform that discussion. Thank you. So, looking at the um, under the pricing section, we look at uh, taxing and cap and trade systems. Do you differentiate between those? I mean, it looks like we put them together just based on the level of price. But I mean, my understanding, do you look at uh, compare the effectiveness of those two approaches? Um, so. Effectively, in our, our modeling, uh, the two approaches are, are equivalent. And so what really matters is just what the price is. And so you can, if we play with the model and set the price of $10, and the model tells us that emissions will be nine units, and if, then if we set the cap at nine units, the price will be $10. Um, and so in, in, to that extent, there, there's no distinction. Um, I would say that an important distinction on cap and trade versus carbon tax is where the uncertainty lies. So under a cap and trade program, we have uncertainty over what the, the price will be. And so the price will fluctuate over time. You see that with REGI, um, where uh, in the lead up to the uh, clean power plan, people thought they were gonna be able to use REGI allowances to comply with the clean power plan. That drove the price up. When President Trump was elected and rescinded the clean power plan, those prices fell. Uh, but you still have the certainty of, of the cap there. With the tax, you have a certainty of the price. You know what the price is gonna be. It's not gonna fluctuate. But you don't know exactly how much the emissions are gonna be. We've done projections here. They're our best guess, but they're not gonna be perfect. Uh, you know, we've, we've done as, as best we can, but we know that we're gonna get that, that level wrong because we're, there's gonna be unanticipated um, things going on to the Vermont and federal economy uh, in the meantime. Um, so that's, that's where this other, other uncertainty uh, lies. And so you don't know exactly what the emissions levels are gonna be. I'd say another important distinction, and this is not necessarily answering your question directly, which Mark did, that we kind of model them similarly, but. Um, just an important distinction between the two policies is around revenue as well. It's more common for permits to be freely allocated uh, under cap and trade programs, which would mean that there would be no revenue associated with, with that program, whereas with carbon pricing, there's kind of always inherently uh, a revenue stream. So that's another important distinction. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the variables among the different Scenarios like, why are they different? Why is the Essex plan, plan looks like it might have the most benefits to Vermont, but explain a little more about why. Um, so the the Essex plan is, uh, I mean, if you just go back to these these couple ones here, um, the Essex plan is maybe even is uh, economy wide, and so it covers um, industrial emissions as well as commercial, residential, and uh, transportation emissions. Um, one reason that you see uh, particularly large um, benefits from these types of policies is that that's where a lot of these, a lot of the particulate matter emissions are actually coming from the industrial sector. And so even just small changes in the industrial sector can have large impacts on these uh, these, these particular matter emissions and have impacts on, on the health benefit. Um, but then, so the, you know, the transport, the only real difference between the, the, the TCI scenario and the WCI scenario as, as in this chart is, is that one includes the transportation heating emissions uh, and, and the one just includes transportation emissions. So really, the, the, if you go from the TCI column to the WCI column, the change there is the extra emissions reductions you would get from uh, covering the heating emissions. And then another distinction which Mark had spoken to before, which kind of shows up here, where we see that there's this distinction um, between Essex and the other policies in terms of the effect to GDP and the change in labor demand, which is how we model you know, change in jobs, um, is that first of all you have a sign change, right? So going from negative impacts to a positive effect here. And as Mark was saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, or please fill in the details, one of the primary reasons for this is that the Essex plan uses some of the revenue to invest in electricity, bringing the electricity prices down. So that sort of foments further economic activity. Um, 
other reasons do you think why the we have a positive effect with SXN? Yeah, it's it's here at least for the the this impacts like the the GDP and the labor. This is it's driven entirely by the use of revenue to lower the price of electricity, which is going to be beneficial to to businesses and homes that that use that use electricity. Their their costs are going down and they'll be able to have more money to spend uh, uh, elsewhere. Yes, uh, when you talk about the uh, value of the benefits uh, or cost, is, you said that was a per year, right? Yes. Is it per individual or per household? In this slide, it's per household. Per household. <coughs> and that's also the quintile. Yeah. This is also per household. Okay. Representative Lefebvre and then you made the outside of your model, but if you take a look at what the impact would be of carbon pricing and carbon taxing on people who live in rural Vermont and are also poor. So we were not able to look at, um, we, could, we looked at by income or by county, not by income and by county. Uh, we just didn't have the, the data available uh, to do that analysis. Uh, we do find that, that rural households are, um, on average, slightly worse off from the policy than uh, the Chittenden County residents. Um, but so here you see that the average rural household is, in the TCI scenario, $7 on average worse off than the Chittenden County residents. So we kind of expect that that change would be similar in, uh, in quintile one. So quintile one, at $53, we, we would probably expect that number to be in the, in the 40s. Um, so they're not going to be, because um, this quintile one number is the average low-income household, not the average low-income rural household. So they, because we know rural, rural residents drive more, we would expect them to have slightly higher energy costs and, and therefore um, slightly lower benefits. It would also be relative to the fact that they, they have no other alternative <coughs> as far as uh, public transportation is concerned too. That's correct. One of the, I'll just say that one of the nuances of the rebate policy is that it can be targeted. So the, the level of rebate that's given to an individual household could be tailored. And that's not something we talk about in this study. Um, it's not something that we model either, uh, but there's no reason why that couldn't be how the policy is implemented per the, per the gentleman's comment on implementation. When you say tailored, can you just exempt? Sure. What I, what I mean by that is, so oftentimes when this type of analysis is done, um, first we look at the expected costs for a given household, and then the rebate is set to at least match those costs so we keep that household whole. Now, that's generally done for a representative household, and, and frankly, that is analysis that's usually done at the federal level, so you have a massive data set of all these different households. In a state the size of Vermont, that's, I think, more feasible, perhaps, to have more detail on what those costs are that are going, that are these incremental costs to households. Um, and you could go by county, so you could know by county and by quintile. Potentially, you could even have a, a mechanism that would allow a household to petition saying this is our annual energy cost. Then you could have a, a benchmark baseline, and then um, their rebate is equal to their increased costs. Now, that could be administratively quite complex, so there's probably somewhere between calculating it for every individual household and having one big lump sum number for the whole state. Um, but just to say there's a, there's a great spectrum of implement, policy implementation potential there that I think could, could meet your needs, which are important. So concern. it would be relative to, not only to the first location and the income? There's, I think that it, it could be done that way. That's, that becomes an administrative question, not so much an analytical one, but I think that it, it could be done that way. We have um, Representative Campbell, Sebelia, and Odie. Hi, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the non-pricing effects that you talked about. And what I'm wondering particularly about is the effect on, on the economy um, if, if we invested money in it and said workforce development and uh, and people to uh, to make, make buildings more efficient, for example. Um, and and can you talk a little bit about 
in the analysis of the risk along those lines? Sure, yeah, so that unfortunately again falls into the category of analysis we weren't able to do just because of the limited scope and budget and that the original scope of work didn't include um, analysis on non-pricing policies. Um, so you took, you took some assumptions from the climate action. Group. Yeah, and those were just emissions reductions assumptions. Okay. So I think that sort of an important recommendation from our report, um, just in terms of further analysis, would be to do further analysis on those types of questions pertaining to non-pricing policies. So what kind of jobs effect would they have? What sort of effect on local and state economy would they have? Um, you know, again, we have initial estimates on the emissions reduction potential, but I think further estimates on that and, and really looking at going from sort of relatively broad brush policies to, um, you know, specific, uh, more fine-grained uh, uh, policy formulation, uh, I think would be good too, so. Most likely that we would, we would uh, expect to see, you know, positive effects um, on GDP and Mark may. Um, disagree with me on this, I'm not sure, but uh, positive effects from investing in, um, you know, if we're investing in energy efficiency projects or weatherization, that's, those are construction jobs. It may not actually be necessarily in a new job that's created, but sort of increase in demand for those services from the construction industry, um, and that can lead to increase in, in, in jobs and also wages. Um, so we have energy workers and all that. Lots yeah. of things like that. Right. Okay, thank you. Representative Sebelia. Thanks. I have uh, three clarifying questions, and uh, happy to take them afterwards if necessary. But uh, the wage levels on the Clinton House again? Mm -hmm. The wage levels on the Clinton House again? Yeah, so uh, quintile one is for anyone who has income below $23,000. Uh, quintile two is twenty-three to forty-five thousand uh, dollars. The next quintile is forty-five to sixty-nine, and then it's sixty-nine to one hundred and five, and then the top quintile is one hundred and five and over. And that's in twenty sixteen dollars. Great. And can you clarify? Did I hear uh, you correctly that quintiles three through five would offset additional costs to quintiles one and two? So what we're showing here is that um, our analysis is suggesting that under these policies that uh, quintiles one and two are always going to be have their costs offset through these rebates. <coughs> um, but for these other quintiles, uh, the rebates the rebates are not uh, large enough uh, to offset their um, their increased energy costs. And, and it, on a share basis, you know the low income households have a higher share of their expenditures on energy, but they actually have lower levels of overall spending because their expenditure levels are much lower. And so you actually, a majority of the energy expenditure takes place by uh, quintile five, or quintiles four and five. And so that's why you're seeing, you know, th those are the, the quintiles that have the higher, um, the higher costs here. Representative Odie. Um, so when you were talking about petitioning for individuals, you were talking about um, the possibility of uh, petitioning for individual consideration. Is there any state that does that now? And, and does anybody look, for instance, at Car inspection time on what, what reads on the odometer. I'm thinking about people who live rurally but don't use their cars that much, or people who live in an urban area but do quite a bit of travel to get to their jobs. Yeah, I mean, there's there are moral hazard issues in, in that type of uh, that type of setup, and by moral hazard issues, I mean people have an incentive to to misreport. Uh, you would have an incentive to say you were lower income than you really were to receive the um, to receive that rebate if there was a cutoff. Um, these rebates are on the magnitude of two hundred to a thousand dollars in these cases. Um, so I don't, you know, if the cutoff is say sixty thousand um, dollars, 
and the rebate is $200, I don't think you're going to see very many people trying to go from $65,000 to $55,000 to make sure they, because they'd want that $10,000, it's a lot more than $200. So I, I, I do think you have, there are some issues with, with that type of setup. And no, I, I'm not aware of any, uh, of any jurisdiction that, um, that, that, that does, does that. Representative Yontoska. Uh, on the Essex plan, um, the Essex plan has uh, incentives for rural and uh, low-income uh, households. Uh, did you take that into consideration when you did these estimates as well? Uh, we did, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think the cutoff for low-income households is uh, four times the federal poverty level, and then rural households with incomes less than $75,000 are eligible for an additional rebate on top of that first rebate, and so we did include that in, in this analysis. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? All right, thank you. Everyone has a lot to read tonight. <laughs>